give a shout out to all the moms this morning. Um, you do a hard job, a difficult job, a thankless job often, and, uh, and uh, I know many of you, you, you just do it with such grace and dignity, and uh, you sow those seeds for a future harvest, and uh, I, I thank you, because you make not only your family better, but you make our community better. Good moms make a world of difference. I, uh, I stand here of a byproduct of a, a good mother, a good grandmother, and uh, I have been blessed, and uh, I have a history of faith because of my grandmother and my mother. So, love you, mom. Love you, grandma. And to my wife, who does such a wonderful job with our children. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, especially to all the single moms this morning. Um, you have my respect and ad, ad, admit. Thank you. You have that as well. <laughs> Being a single mom is, uh, is quite the task. And uh, I know we have many in the church that are single moms. And so we just, I just want to take a moment and just notice you. And uh, You carry a heavy load. And uh, God is with you. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, why don't we pray for the mothers right now? Lord, I just, I just really thank you, God, for mothers who have, <clears throat> have got, uh, got, gone above and beyond, Father. Lord, those mothers that have, uh, the stepmothers and the single moms that have carried a, a load and a burden that wasn't uh, your perfect plan, but God, they have just stepped in and they have done it and they've been willing to do it, Lord, and Lord, we just we, we, we have been blessed, God. I have been blessed. And, I, and this church is blessed with good mothers, Father. And we thank you for them, God. We, we take this moment to recognize them, God. And I pray just a blessing, the blessing of heaven over their lives, Father. God, that you would just, uh, they would just feel your, your provision and your grace, Lord, as they walk through every day, Lord, as they go through all the hardships of, of, of having to try to do their best and not always having all the solutions, God. I just pray your grace and your mercy, over them, God, and I, and I just pray that they would be blessed abundantly by, by the Father who loves them and their children, God. We thank you, Lord. Amen. That's pretty much the end of my Mother Day's message. <laughs> but um, it's good to be here this morning. Thanks for coming out. You make a world of difference by being here. Because otherwise, I would be all by myself. <laughs> Except for my mom and my grandma, they would come because. <laughs> uh, last time I preached, I, uh, I started my sermon by talking about uh, a little bit about our role in breakthrough. And I kind of want to go back to that a little bit. Um, I talked about how we have to prepare for breakthrough. That a, a, a lot to do about breakthrough is, is our doing. Like the woman with the issue of blood who uh, had to push through the crowd to touch the hem of, of, of Jesus. See, Jesus was there the whole time. Jesus was willing to heal the whole time. Uh, he was willing to provide the breakthrough, but she had to get up and push through and touch him. I, I've been thinking a lot about breakthrough because as people of faith, our faith is supposed to lead us to a place where breakthrough is a necessity. As a matter of fact, the need for breakthrough is an element of faith. I would go so far to say that if you don't need breakthrough, you're not really living by faith. Because as the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, for we live by faith and not by sight. See, faith is what I cannot do on my own. In my own strength. That's why I need breakthrough. But here's the catch. So much of breakthrough on our part is found in consistency and hard work. 
the older I get, the more I see that and, and the more I appreciate that. See, David couldn't kill Goliath without God. He couldn't do it in his own strength. But David had to learn how to work the sling before he faced Goliath. Moses couldn't set Israel free without God. But Moses had to learn to use the staff before he set anyone free. See, understand, there's an element of breakthrough you're looking for that's already in your grasp. God has already given you an element, a part, a, a seed of the breakthrough that you want. It's already available. It, it's in your life. But it's only going to come through consistency and hard work. Like if David, if, if David hadn't practiced with the sling, if David had never taken the time and, and cared for the sheep, David would have stood before Goliath unable and unprepared. David would not have gotten his breakthrough. But there was an element where David had beforehand of of hard work and consistency in David's life where he learnt with the sling, he grew in the practice of the sling, so when he stood before Goliath, he was able to get his breakthrough and see Goliath fall. But without it, he wouldn't have seen his breakthrough, and that's a sobering thought. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that really used to bug me when I was younger. Proverbs 3.12 says, Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father, the son he disciplines. He delights in, sorry. And that used to really bother me as a kid, especially because, you know, discipline just seems so negative and so, like, horrible. And, and it's, 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 I couldn't really appreciate it. See, I saw discipline different back then. I saw it as taken away from me. But what God has been showing me is how discipline is all about what God wants to bless me with. Discipline is about the good God wants for my life. God's discipline is there to prepare you so you don't stand empty-handed before the giant. It's like this. I love ice cream. Thank you. I knew, I, you know, I knew I'd get a shout-out from you. Like, I, I love ice cream, you know? Like chocolate ice cream, or I'm a big Tagger ice cream fan. Like I know, like that's kind of a kid ice cream, but man, I love Tagger ice cream. Oh, black licorice. But I also like being in shape. I find it hard to say no to ice cream. I do not like saying no to ice cream. The idea of saying no to ice cream is sacrilegious. I mean, you shouldn't do that. It just seems wrong on so many levels. But I find it easy to say yes to being in shape. I want to be in shape. I like being in shape. You ask me, Joe, do you want to be in shape? And, and, And without a doubt, it's an easy answer, yes. Like, I want to be in shape. See, I don't have to run around saying no to everything because that's just so negative. Like, no. None of us like hearing no. No one likes saying no. See, all I really have to do is just say yes. Just say yes to being in shape. That takes care of all the no's. See, God's discipline is not this big list of no's. It's about saying yes to his blessing, saying yes to his best. Like, and, and that's easy to do. Like, I want God's best in my life. I want his blessing. But understand, yes only works with consistency and hard work. Yes to being in shape means exercise. Yes to being in shape means eating broccoli. And the more I say yes, the more work I do, the more breakthrough I have. Isn't that great news? Like I think sometimes we have to just, you know, we have to rewire our brains a little bit so that we, we, we look at things from a different perspective. The no's are negative. The no's suck. No one wants to say no. No one wants to live in a world where it's always no. But if I, if I refocus it and go, you know, this is what I want. I can say yes to what I really want. I can say yes to being in shape. I I mean, yes, I want to be in shape. Then I don't have to worry about the no's. I just focus on the yeses. 
You don't have to work. You don't have to focus on the things that you feel like God's saying no to in your life. You just focus on what God wants to give you in your life. It's great news, but, and we all knew there was a but coming. I have found that many people have the intentions of the yes, and I have in my life, but lack the follow through that comes with the yes. As most of you know, I have two daughters, my, a four-year-old and a 12-year-old. Now, my Elizabeth, who's 12, she, I can tell her, go clean your room, Elizabeth. And she says yes. And, and she's pretty good at doing it. See, she understands and she's been taught that if she doesn't follow through, there will be consequences. Now, Linnea, my four-year-old, it's a bit of a different story. <laughs> We tell her to go clean her room, and you would think that we asked her to go outside and butcher her pet bunny. <laughs> I mean, there's pouting, there's pleading, there's throwing herself on the ground and crying and tearing. I mean, it's this whole production that in the reality, if she would just, in the time it takes for the production, if she would just go clean her room, it would be done. And so this is, and this is the hard part of parenting. We then have to walk her through the process of understanding that cleaning her room is really not the end of the world. And this is so hard because the amount of time and energy it takes to convince a four-year-old of anything, I mean, it would just be so much easier to go clean the room myself. But understand something. That's their game. Those little kids, yeah, they look all cute and innocent. <laughs> but they're not. They're trying to break you. Uh, they want to suck the life out of you. And I fear often that she's winning. But now, if Elizabeth acted like Linnea, see, my response would be totally different. I wouldn't try to convince her of anything. Because she's 12. Like she would have a reason to cry, as my mother used to always say. See, I expect her to deal with some things. I expect a certain level of maturity. I expect her to control her emotions and deal with certain situations in her life. Like hearing no. Like not getting everything her way. Like having to do things she doesn't want to do. See, that is maturity. And honestly, one of the biggest obstacles I see to breakthrough in, in, in the church today and, and in many lives today is simply immaturity. Like God's discipline, it's all about bringing you to a place of maturity. So you can handle, and this is an important thing to understand, all the blessing he wants to give to you. That's why he disciplines those he loves. Like back to my girls, I expect for from Elizabeth, but I also give her more. I expect more and I give her more. She gets to do things that at this point Linnea doesn't. Not because I love her more, but because I know she can handle more. I know that she's more responsible. And so a lot of times in our life, we find ourselves in, in situations and we think, God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I having to go through this? And what we need to understand is it's God's way of disciplining us. Proverbs 3.12, because as the Father because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Again, because he's a good father, because he loves you, because he wants to give you more. Isn't that good? Discipline is a good thing. It's a sign that there's good things to come. It's a sign your, of, of your preparation. But when we don't see it that way, when we act like Linnea and, and we throw a fit and we act up and we get all emotional... You ever been there? We ended up having to stay in the process that's that much longer than just cleaning your room and getting on with your life. So you understand, good parents, they don't always work everything out for their kids. Good parents let their kids hear the word no. Good parents teach their kids to deal with disappointment, to help their children come to a place of maturity. 
Like the Bible says in Psalm 66.10, for you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. He tests us. And you know how he tests us? By the response of our heart when we don't get our way, with the waiting, with the no's, with the disappointments. It's a test of your maturity that you have to go through to be, to be ready to receive the blessing that he wants to bring into your life. See, what I'm really trying to do this morning, just kind of readjust your, 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 your thoughts a little bit on this, this whole idea, because I, I believe that there's much that God wants to bring into your life, but you're always, and I, I know for myself, I'm always fighting against it. I'm fighting against the process of it, but if I begin to see it the way he sees it, if I begin to understand it the way that, that he's bringing it about in my life, then it's easier to give myself to it. He's a good father. See, the reality is nothing shows our heart condition like a no, like a wait. And it's easy to praise God when he gives me what I want. Like, I can be Linnea's biggest hero. I can buy her love. All I have to do is just say yes. My wife will be having a talk with me, but, but Linnea will love me. Just give her what she wants. Buy the puppy. Give the candy. Let her stay up. But see, the test is, how do I praise him when he leaves me in a hard situation, when he doesn't just fix my problem? Am I going to use what he's already given me? Am I going to put into practice my faith? I have found in my own walk, lots of times God doesn't take me out of the mess. Sometimes he gives me a shovel and says, start digging. Because it's in the digging that you become strong. It's in the digging that you grow. It's in the digging that you're changed. Like the reality is, it's the no's that mature me. It's the disappointments that mold me. It's the setbacks that shape me, refining me like silver. So this morning, I want to give you a couple of areas that, that you just need to guard your, your life as you go through this test of maturity. And, and understand, it's not an age thing. And it's a process that it, we're always going through because the reality is God always is trying to expand us and grow us and he always has more th- uh, of himself that he wants to give to us. So unfortunately, we never actually get to a place where it's done with. But the first thing is in, in the test of maturity that you're going to go through is, is the, having the ability to, to filter your emotions. Let me start with this. I understand God created you as emotional beings. Emotions are a good thing. Like I feel like sometimes emotions get a, a, a bad rap. But emotions are a good thing. Emotions mean that you feel. Emotions mean that you're alive. Emotions are powerful. Uh, some of the great the emotions are, are, have been the catalyst for great acts of heroism and, and devotion. I mean, emotions, God has given you emotions. And so we can't just stand there and say, oh, no, you know, it's, it's you know, don't, don't be all emotional, don't, don't, like, no, those, I feel like sometimes we, we curse our own emotions, is what I'm trying to say, we, 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 because it, it becomes such a negative thing, and so, but you know, a lot of times, some of the most sensitive people, some of the people that have the most, are kind of the most in touch with their emotions, they have the, the most, uh, They hear God in a, in a special way. They have real sensitive, sensitivity, not only naturally, but spiritually. And, and so emotions are, are a great tool. Their emotions are a great thing. And they've been, they, have, they have been the catalyst for great acts of heroism and devotion. The early apostles, they established a church out of their emotions for Jesus. The Bible says it like this in Revelation 12, 11, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. See, their love for Christ superseded their love for their own lives. What a powerful uh, ability and effect of emotions. That they would give up their own lives for, for, this, for, for the call of God. Emotions are like that. And yet, the power of emotions that has done such good, we have seen the same emotions manipulate for evil, like, like Hitler in post-World War I Germany. 
The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? See, we're not just to be emotional beings. We're not just to act out of our emotions. There's an aspect of logic and reason that that we have to use with our emotions. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows through it. See, what the Bible's really saying here is you have to guard your emotions. You have to understand the power of your emotions because much of your emotions will affect the destiny of your life. That's a powerful thought. Just ask anyone who's ever fallen in love. You do stupid things when you fall in love. Like sell your motorbike to help pay for a wedding. (laughs) Such is the power of emotions. But here's the good news. God has given us tools to help filter our emotions. And the first tool that he's given us is his word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing souls and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges, and this is the part I want to focus on, it judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Again, this is why you need the word. It will help you to filter your feelings and emotions. It will help you to guide your decisions so you don't just make emotional ones. It will help you distinguish what God is saying and and, and what's just your feelings. It helps judge the thoughts and attitude of your heart. The second tool is godly relationships. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. You know, this is like reason 348 of why going to church is so important. We need each other. We need the wisdom of the body. We need people who walk with us, who can help us step back from our feelings and look at things objectively. Proverbs 27, uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. See, you need people in your life that will tell you the hard stuff. And you have to let people in enough that you'll trust them when they speak the truth that you don't want to hear. She's not just about having a lot of relationships. It's about having people that will actually speak the truth. That's a real blessing in your life when you have someone that will speak the truth to you. It really sucks, but it's a blessing. (laughs) But you have to be willing to receive it. You have to understand that they want the best for you and, and not get all defensive and, 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 and want to push them away. Proverbs 16.1.2 says this, I like this, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. See, to us, we can often fool ourselves. All the person's ways seem pure to them. See, it's not enough just to follow your heart. The second area to guard your life as you go through a test of maturity is with your talk. And I know I've spoken on this before, and I know I'm going to speak on this again. Such is the power of our talk. It's just too important. Jeremiah 3.6 says, The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it and itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animal, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures have been tamed and have and have been tamed by mankind, but no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Father, with our we, tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You see that? It says, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. See, there's a power to what you say. And and a sure sign of immaturity is what we allow allow to come out of our mouths. See, when you're in a hard situation, you have to have the maturity not just speak your emotions. Because the emotions of the moment will pass, uh, but what you say has been released, and it's really, really hard to take back your words. And the Bible says that you can set the whole course 
of one's life on fire with our words. The whole course of your life can change with what comes out of your mouth. See, maturity is weighing your words. And God takes that seriously. In Judges 1, it says, um, in Judges 1, God lays out the, the, a list of judgment. It says in verse 14, and listen, listen, listen to this. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and convict all of them with the, all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness. And all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their advantage. He says, like he kind of, he's saying this is why the world's going to be judged. And, and, and then he says, like at the top of his list, these people are grumblers. Like, like to me, like if I was making a list of all the reasons why, you know, the world should be judged, I could come up with all these big sins You know, like all the horrible kind of sins I'd want to point out. But God chooses grumblers. I find that very interesting. That's at the top of the list. What we say is that important. And this was God's complaint against Israel. Every time he would take them through something and deliver them and set them free as he tried to take them from the bondage of Egypt to the promised land. And he would take them through all these hardships and he would, he would deliver them and they'd see all these miraculous things. But, but what would happen time and time again is that every time they come to another crisis, instead of trusting his leading, they would complain and grumble. Number 14 says, verse 26, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In the wilderness your bodies will fall, every one of you 20 years or more, who has counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. See, God eventually let them all die in the wilderness. They never matured, so they never got the blessing. Like, it's a, so, it's a really sobering kind of thought, is that just what comes out of our mouths, God weighs those words. See, I really believe that complaining and grumbling, and the reason why God doesn't like it so much is that it's the devil's praise language. Because what we're really saying is, I don't trust God. I don't trust his plan. I don't trust his process that he has for my life. It denies the work of faith in our lives. And because you're complaining against God's plan and you're complaining against his process, you're going to miss what God has for you in this season. See, God has a plan. He had a plan to get Israel to the promised land. But they had to go through some hard situations. There was going to be some tests along the way. And their complaining and grumbling killed their faith for the test. So they spent 40 years dying in the wilderness. God's got a plan for your life. It's a good plan. But you're going to go through some hard situations. Don't spend 40 years in the wilderness killing your faith with your words. Now hear my heart on this. I'm not saying we should shut down our emotions and just pretend that everything's good when it's not. It's healthy to vent. It's, it's healthy to express our feelings. The Bible says David brought his complaints before the Lord. But I would challenge you that you don't let your complaints outweigh your praise. Let me say that again. I would challenge you that you don't let your, your complaints outweigh your praise. Don't allow your focus to see only the negative of your situation, but also recognize and express thanksgiving for all that you've been given. And I, th- I really believe this is kind of the key to it because you're going to go through some battles. You're going to go through some hard times. You're going to go through some situations where you just want to give up and quit and say, God, this is enough. And, and, and you, and you want to, you know, it, it, that happens to us. We're human. Our, our, we feel the emotion of what we're going through and, and it's okay to express our heart, but I need to keep coming back to this place of praise where I say, okay, 
okay, God, through it all yet, I will praise you. God, you are still wonderful. You are still good. You are still God. You're still on the throne. You're still making a way for my life. God, I don't like this. this. This is hurting me. But God, I thank you that I know that you're still in charge. Thank you that you're still making a way for me. Thank you that you've given me uh, friends and a church. And, and, and thank you that I have your presence. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not on my own in this. Thank you. Because it's so easy to let the emotion take over and just focus on the negative. And, and we live in this place, like Israel, where we just live in this place of negativity. And we just keep going around and around and around and around and around. And yet the whole time God's saying, there's something for you in this place that's going to take you to the next place. There's a blessing here for your life in this time that's, that's for, for what's to come. But you got to begin to see it from a place of maturity. And so that takes controlling your emotions. That takes filtering your talk. Your word has power, and they affect your soul. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. See, your words, they feed your soul. What comes out of your mouth? And you're going to feed on what comes out of your mouth. See, Israel, they, they could have talked. This is the thing. Israel, they, they could have talked themselves into the promised land, but instead they, they killed their faith for breakthrough with their words. Believe it or not, this is actually a Mother's Day message because I was praying the other day and I was lamenting. It's a fancy word for complaining. Different areas of my life. And, I, you know, I'm embarrassed, actually. To, uh, um, because sometimes my own immaturity is just so striking to me. And I, you know, I was, I was kind of like, okay, God, like I was looking for God to comfort me. I was looking for God to say, you know, Joe, it's okay. You know, kind of like, you know, like when you're a little kid and you come to your mother and, and this is like, mothers are so good at this. Like they, they, they take you in and they, you know, they hold you and they kind of, you know, oh, my baby, it's okay, my baby. Oh, look at your chubby little cheeks, my baby. You know, like that kind of like only the way a mother can do that to you and you just feel, oh, you know, yeah, mommy understands that, you know, the, the world's so mean to me and so awful to me, and, but my mommy loves me and thinks I'm special. But God didn't do that. Instead, I heard this other voice of my mother that I grew up with. <laughs> and basically saying, like, quit acting like a baby and suck it up. I think you said that a time or two, probably more to Dennis than me, but. <laughs> like, she, I, didn't, I didn't feel like God was going to kiss and comfort, like kiss the boo-boo and comfort me. But instead, like a good mother does, often they'll challenge you. you see, I've, I've been blessed with, as I said, strong women in my life, women who are survivors, women who are overcomers. Women who had their faith, who, who, who their faith was not luxury but a lifeline. And as I said, I, I thank God for my mother, my grandmother, my wife, and who taught me tough love. The kind of love that causes you to grow up. That isn't content to let you remain a child, but believes enough in the potential of your life to challenge you. To say it's not okay to just go through with an immature attitude. And that's why I feel like God was saying to me. And understand this morning, he loves you enough to prepare you for what he has for you. He disciplines you because he loves you. You're the child he delights in. And he sees all that he has for you and he wants you to go to that place of promise, the promised land of your life that he has. But he takes us and he puts us in these places where he says, okay, you got to clean up this part of your life. And so he's not just going to sit there and do it for you. He's going to say, okay, come on, you can do this. I know you can do this. 
yeah, it's, it's not all peaches and cream and rainbows and lollipops and unicorns. Sometimes it's just a shovel in your hands and just digging. But it's with a destiny in mind. It's with your goodness and the blessing over your life in mind. He's a good father. Amen? Yes. Amen. Why don't you just stand? Lord, I just thank you, God, once again for this church, these people, Lord. God, I just pray that this message would have spoken to their heart and they would just understand more of the depths of your love for them. Lord, I thank you that you love us enough to challenge us. You love us enough not to just leave us. Lord, you love us enough to help grow us and mature us. And I pray, Father, as we go through the difficult areas and difficult situations in our life, Lord, that we would be really conscious of our emotions and our feelings and the words that come out of our mouth. Lord, that you would surround us with good people. And Lord, that we'd find the truth of your word and we'd allow the truth of, of your word to just shape us and, defi- and uh, give us definition to our emotions. So I thank you, God. I pray, God, once again, just your blessing over the mothers. I pray, Lord, that people just have a great day today with, uh, with their kids. Uh, celebrating the goodness of mothers that you've given us and, and just for all that you've done for us. We love you, Jesus. And the church of God said.